Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, glad to see you. You knew that I was coming, and you still came. Uh, how, how, how wonderful is that? It's in the, it's in the realm of modern-day miracles, isn't it? Uh, so uh, there we are. It reminds me in um, my first circuit, um, I said to them, why are you putting the preacher's name outside? Well, we always put the preacher's name outside. I said, yes, but why are you putting the preacher's name outside? They said, well, we always do it. I said, but there's only two sorts of people who see my name outside. Those who don't know me, who don't care, and those who do know me, who don't come. <laughs> so there we are. Right then, that's it. Off with the funnies and on with the scripture passage. Now, the scripture passage today is from Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. It's page 1,238 in the Bibles. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, there are some on the front row now. Grab one now. So, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing round the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Let's just take a moment to pray together. God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for that wonderful passage from your word, the Holy Scriptures. And we pray that you would speak to us that in the power of the Holy Spirit and by the written word of truth, that we may be equipped to worship you, to serve you faithfully, to bear testimony in the church and in the world. Lord, hear these are our prayers in the name of Jesus, Lord and Saviour. Amen. In the summer of 1972, in the summer of 1972, a young woman named Claire Torrey attended the Abbey Road Recording Studios in London. She was engaged as a session artist to be the vocalist on a song for which she would be paid £30. The song didn't really merit the name song as there were no words. And just to make it complicated, when Claire arrived at the recording studios, there was no tune either. The song, without words or tune, turned out to be a song about dying. Those who had engaged her to record said, it's about dying. Have a bit of a gnaw on that which she did. 
the completed record became the dark side of the moon. Who has listened to the dark side of the moon? Oh, well, about half. That's good. Uh, by the progressive rock group Pink Floyd, the seventh best-selling album in the UK ever. So if you've not listened to it, well, when you've listened to the other six, get to that one. From this point onwards, however, the dark side of the moon, the themes explored by the words and music of Pink Floyd became, according to the music journal Rolling Stone, almost unremittingly bleak, what the philosopher calls nihilism. Well, you know, I was born in 1958, so I was a teenager in the 1970s, and all those of us who were teenagers in the 1970s who listened to that kind of thing were receiving the message of nihilism. Goodness, what's nihilism? Well, in one form, it contends that life, indeed everything, is without meaning, purpose, or value. You know, you're born, you live, you die, so what? For the last half century, perhaps more, people in the developed nations of the world have been subjected to this message. Life is ultimately without meaning. I've already upset someone, have I? Um, that's okay. J just tell them I'll improve. Um, life is ultimately without meaning, purpose, or value. I think this is a way into conversation with people in the wider community. You know, people say to me, oh, it's really difficult, they say, to, to relate what I hear on Sunday to what people are saying to me in conversations of ordinary everyday life. I wonder really if that is the case, because people are looking for meaning, purpose, and value in life. Not everybody is extreme as that everything is ultimately without meaning, purpose, or value, but people are often questioning, what is the meaning, purpose, or value of this? And here, the Christian gospel offers an alternative. We find meaning, purpose, and value where? Answer, in Jesus. We find meaning, purpose, and value in Jesus. Now, our Bible passage, Revelation, sets out this heavenly vision and of the church in earth and in heaven. Now, Revelation, I suggest, is not the easiest of books. I always, you know, think of something about Revelation. Uh, there was a lady, all my ministry, so how long is that now? Well, all my ministry as a circuit minister now is in its 42nd year. And all my ministry, I've tried on a regular basis, you know, at least 20 times a year, to have Bible studies in one or more of the churches where I've had pastoral charge. And a lady who never came to any of the Bible studies said, why don't we do a Bible study on Revelation? And I replied, well, you haven't come to the easy ones. Why would you come to the difficult one? <laughs> Somebody said that was a bit robust, but I mean, it was just the truth. You, know, you didn't come to any of the easy ones. Revelation isn't the easiest book in the Bible, is it? It's not even one of the easier books in the New Testament, sometimes called the Apocalypse. This is how I describe it. Some people are here who've attended my Bible studies, so they all know this already, but here we go. It's like being in a theater, and all is in darkness. The stage is concealed from your view by a heavy curtain. Suddenly, the curtain opens and you see behind the curtain a fantastic world, some things that you recognize, some things that seem unrecognizable, some things that happen in the ordinary realm of life, other things that don't happen in the ordinary realm of life at all. And you look at this for a while and ponder on its meaning, 
when all too soon the curtain closes and all is dark again. And that is apocalyptic or revelation. Here in the Bible, right at the end, the curtain opens. You look and you have to evaluate those things which are within the realm of the familiar and those things that are totally unfamiliar to us and see the story. But we see a company of people in heaven. And what I want to tell you about this company of people in heaven is, first of all, they are redeemed. They are redeemed. Now, some years ago, I was preaching at Park Lane Methodist Church, Wembley, London. I had to say that very carefully because having said it not so carefully, one of my members was spreading the rumor that I'd been preaching at Wembley Stadium. Well, it was a good rumor, but uh, nonetheless not true. We had a large congregation at Park Lane Methodist Church, Wembley, though not exactly a great multitude. You know, there was over a hundred, and it was representative of people from all over the world. It put me in mind of my first congregation in the Surrey suburbs in Greater London, Mitcham, Surrey. I said to my, congrega my congregation one Sunday morning, and today we have people from all five continents of the world with us. If I had my ministry over again, I'd have kept a book and noted down daft things that people said to me at the door. This, however, wasn't among the daftest. A member on leaving said, there's six. I said, well, how do you mean there's six? Oh, well, North and South America count as two these days. Hmm. All right. And so the next time I was there, I said to them, quite truthfully, and today in our congregation we have people from all six continents of the world. Somebody at the door says to me, there's seven. I say, well, there's there's seven. Well, Antarctica. So the next time I was there, I said to them, and today in our congregation we have people from all seven continents of the world, but the two penguins have had to leave early. <laughs> There's something really, to me anyway, rather wonderful about being in a cosmopolitan congregation. You know, that's like being in Cornwall and having a handful of people from Devon. You know? But it's wonderful to be in a cosmopolitan congregation. And there's something also exciting about belonging to a great crowd. The greatest crowd that I've been in is 38,000 when Plymouth Argyle played Santos. Video available on YouTube. I don't need to tell you the score. You can watch it for yourself. The largest Christian crowd that I've been in is 23,000 at the Crystal Palace Athletic Stadium on three occasions when I heard Billy Graham. Ooh, but fancy being in a crowd of 144,000. The first, John says, he heard, he heard the crowd of 144,000. I suggest it's a, it's a symbolic number. It's 12 squared and 1,000, isn't it? It, it? it seems to be a Jewish crowd. The second crowd he saw, and he said, it is one that no one could count from every nation of the world. Millions of people from every age and generation, they are standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. Make no doubt about it, the Lamb is undoubtedly a title for Jesus. Now, people in church, I think that's us, are reasonably comfortable with using the word redeemed. But I don't think it's a common 
everyday word. So now, to save the long journey of getting up from my desk and walking a few feet to the bookshelf, on word, of course, you just right-click and get synonyms, don't you? So I tried this. For redeemed, it offered me cash in, exchanged, converted, bought back. That's the one I wanted, I think. Bought back. There are always some miserable people around, aren't they? Who say, well, if Jesus has bought us back, who did he pay the money to? So you have to say to them, well, it's really rather like compensation. It's that which needs to be done to pay for the damage, putting it right. Compensation. We are redeemed. We are bought back. The people standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb are not simply honored as God's servants. They have value. Well, that's good to know, isn't it? You have value in Jesus. You could say to somebody, and I think I'll have a go at it sometime, when you see the cross, what should you think? Well, I mean, you can say all kinds of things, but one thing that you could say, particularly to a person who tells you that they feel worthless, is you have infinite value in Jesus. How do we know that? Because of the cross. We have been bought back. We have been redeemed. The vision of heaven is the antidote to anyone who feels worthless and feels that their life is meaningless. Now, I'm sorry to say this, but it is nonetheless true. The church has played down in my lifetime the notion of this kind of redemption, bought back with the blood of Jesus, shed on the cross, and has offered us, you know, some kind of cycle babble that, you know, oh, we're all valuable in Jesus, but never tells them why. They might even say, well, everyone's valued, valuable to God. Well, of course, that's true, but it isn't got the clarity that we want. The clarity that we want is we are valuable to God in Jesus who has bought us back with the price of his own life, his own blood. None of us is worthless to God. We are all of inestimable value to him. But just, becomes, just because redemption comes freely doesn't mean that it comes without cost. They're all bought, all these, the redeemed, are bought with a price and robed in the righteousness of Christ and are holding palm branches. Now, it's just sort of interesting to ask you, how many times in the New Testament are palm branches mentioned? Many or few or I'd say a few. A few. A few. Thirty two. That's a put in a number on it. Put in a number on it. Well the answer is palm branches are only mentioned twice in the New Testament. So well done, nearest answer. David is in charge of the prizes, okay? Uh, only mentioned twice in the New Testament, here and in John twelve, verse thirteen. But the palm is very important in New Testament times. Palms are symbols of victory, and some, some uh, coins were stamped with a palm and included the phrase, the redemption of Zion. They are redeemed. We are redeemed, and they are rejoicing. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Revelation chapter 7, verse 10. Now here's a picture of worship in heaven. And if we wanted to get worship right, and in my ministry, uh, one of the big issues has been worship and getting worship right, as it were. If we want to get worship right, well, there are some patterns in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, of how worship might be properly focused. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. God the invisible 
has appeared. He has appeared in person. He has appeared as Jesus, the Lamb of God. You remember in the opening to John's Gospel when John the Baptist is uh, exercising his ministry. The Gospels begin, don't they, with the ministry of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist sees Jesus on the hillside and announces him. Now, this is a special text to me because when you're a preacher, um, you might not remember the text of your second, third, fourth, fifth, and all the rest of its sermon. Uh, sometimes I feel a bit awkward in the week when I meet one of my members who says to me something about the service last Sunday, and I don't remember that one either. So take some consolation. But I remember the first one. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold is a much better word than look, isn't it? Look in the greengrocer's shop as to have little eyelashes and little, you know, little pupils just to cheer up a very dull word. Behold, take a really good look at the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who is he? He is Jesus. The Lamb of God was introduced in this in the gospel, in the words of John the Baptist. The innumerable crowd are stood in front of Jesus. What is the focus of worship? Answer, Jesus, who, though bearing the scars of his passion, what do we talk about when we talk about Jesus? We talk about his cross, and he is clothed in glory and majesty of his resurrection. What is the focal point of worship? It is Jesus. What about Jesus? It is his death and resurrection. A truly awesome sight. We see God in Jesus. Now, uh, over the August holiday period, uh, we decided to have a little trip to London to catch up with some older friends. Older meaning older than us, not necessarily old, though two separate friends were both uh, 86 this year. Uh, my long-standing friend Jean from my placement in Notting Hill, London, who was born in Barbados, and our long-standing friend uh, Beatrice. Um, to be honest, I don't know where Beatrice was born. She's of Ghanaian heritage, so it was wonderful um, to see them both. And uh, uh, we went to the congregation where I was minister 34 years ago, uh, there wasn't anybody there that we knew apart from Beatrice and her family. Everybody else uh, had either died or moved on or both. And uh, uh, we were there and it was a good occasion. And we also went to the minister's house. The minister was from Kenya. And he took me to the church where I, the, you know, I had two. He took me to the smaller of the two churches where I'd been minister 34 years ago. I hadn't been there um, since. Uh, so it was interesting just to um, go inside uh, the building and to, to, to see things there. But it was the congregation there that I said a rather outrageous thing. Uh, we'd sung a song and I said to them afterwards, if I sent a picture to one of the national papers and asked them for a congregation, for a caption for the congregation this morning, they would never get the word rejoicing. They'd never get it. We didn't look as if we were rejoicing. And, uh, you know, forgive me for the times when I haven't looked as if I'm rejoicing. I do tend to be fairly moderate in the expression of emotions. But rejoicing? Why are congregations not rejoicing? Well, this is it. Tough talk, I suppose. If you don't acknowledge that you were lost, you can never celebrate that you are saved. We're rejoicing. Why? Well, because we're redeemed. Because we're saved. We're saved from sin and death and God's judgment. And we're rejoicing because once we were lost, but now we are found. And all those who are stood around the throne, the angels and the elders, fell down on their faces to worship God. Now, when I was on the placement in Notting Hill in 1981, 
uh, I was sent by my supervisor. He said, and on Saturday evening, I want you to go to a special service with Bishop Campbell. Well, look, I'll confide in you, friends. I was 23 in London on a Saturday night. I didn't fancy much going to an event with a bishop. Um, sorry, Reverend Gentleman, but there you go. You know, I just didn't fancy it. There were plenty of other things to do on a Saturday night, and I was up for doing those, not for going to meet the bishop. Something that the supervisor said should have triggered some suspicion in my mind. He said, the event starts round about six. If I were you, I'd get there between 7.30 and 8. I didn't question it. I just did what he said. Not knowing that I would be attending the annual convention of the Church of God in London, an Afro-Caribbean congregation, mainly Caribbean, to a celebration. And, uh, well, I am a bit Anglo-Saxon at the best of times that I'm there, and it's, it's kind of all happening around me. I promise you I was genuinely looking joyful. Um, uh, and... Uh, then the uh, person, the, 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 the bishop's wife, actually, Missionary Campbell, she was uh, styled, she said, we are so pleased to see our brother from the Methodist Church. And we're going to ask him now to give us the word of the Lord. What a wonderful moment for them. Uh, not for me. Uh, because uh, I, I didn't know. I had between where I was sitting and the lectern to come up with the passage. Uh, any prizes for guessing what uh, passage I chose? No prizes at all. I chose this passage from Revelation chapter 7. People from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Isn't that wonderful? You know, there have been people on our streets recently who don't want that. They want church and society, but they're not probably bothered very much about church, are they? They want it all to be very, very monochrome. Well, when we get to glory, it isn't going to be monochrome. It's going to be very cosmopolitan from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And as I begin to speak to the congregation, unlike my lovely Methodist congregations, they were not at all passive. They would shout, Amen! And praise the Lord. And that's, uh, you know, new if you're, if you're not used to it. But rather unnervingly, if I slowed up at all, they were, you know, to gather your thoughts in order to know what to say next because you've got no notes and no preparation and whatever and you're just there. They would shout, there's more. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> after the third or fourth one, I wasn't sure that there was more. <laughs> But I quoted an old, you'd call it a Sankey hymn. San Sankey is a misnomer in that he was only an editor of a hymn book. He didn't actually write very many, but this one would be f familiar from his co collection or from the Redemption hymnal. And it ran like this. So I quoted the hymn, Would you be free from your burden of sin? Carry on. There's power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. And the chorus goes, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. What I hadn't expected when I quoted the hymn was for them spontaneously to sing it for about 15 to 20 minutes. In the middle of the address that I was trying to sing, to, to, to give. There is power, power, wonder-working power 
in the precious blood of the Lamb. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen! Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. They are rejoicing. We are redeemed in Jesus. We are rejoicing in Jesus. And then they are restored. Now, this is verses 13 and 14. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The elder is not specifically identified. I don't know if it is a saint from the Old Testament or from the New or an angel, but in any event, the important item is not the identity of the, the elder, but the identity of the crowd. It seems that John doesn't know where they've come from. And when the elder asks him, where, you know, where have they come from? He says, you know the answer to this. And the elder says, they've come out of the great tribulation. Now, the Bible speaks of three different types of tribulations or distress, so I suppose we ought to distinguish between them. Firstly, there is the tribulation that is inseparable from Christian life in the world. John 16, verse 33. Secondly, there's a time of in intense tribulation that the Bible says will come at the end times. And thirdly, the Bible speaks of a time of God's wrath on unbelievers. Now, while I have to deal with the word great, I'm inclined to think that the tribulation here is the tribulation that is inseparable from Christian life in the world, through which all Christians pass. When I think of the word um, uh, tribulation and the end of the world, I'm put in mind of George the motor mechanic. Now, George the motor mechanic had a, a, a little, you know, garage, little motor mechanic's place on the sort of perimeter of a rough car park where I often used to park my car in one of the villages where I've been minister over the years. And he got to know me as I pulled up very near. His specialism, I mean, people who appear cars will be, uh, you, you, you know, cars appeal to you, you'll be in awe of them. His specialism was making roadworthy mini metros. You know? So, a noble calling. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes, yes. Ferrari, Lamborghini, uh, Aston Martin, and all that. Forget about that. It's restoring the mini metro that was George's calling. On this particular occasion, he engaged me in bright conversation. Um, as people in my home neck of the woods, you know, not blessed with the lovely southeast Cornwall accent that you have, but with the whining Plymouth accent that I have, he said to me, want a cup of garage tea? Well, I mean, with an offer like that, how could I refuse? I said, yeah, go on then, George, all right. He went out, he was gone for a very, very long time. Eventually, he, he reappeared with a cup well, no self-respecting charity shop would have taken it. But he passed me the cup of garage tea, and he engaged me in cheery conversation, as only people from my part of the world can do. You know, I can describe a Plymouth Argyle experience, you know. All right, then? Yeah. Go Argo? Yeah. How we get on? One free nil? You know, I mean, it sounds miserable, even when it's happy. And... <laughs> George seemed to manage to sound especially miserable, really. He said to me, 
you wonder where it's all coming to, don't you? I said, how do you mean, George? Well, you know everything. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, you know the world. I said, really? Yeah, you wonder where it's all coming to. I said, what you mean? Ecological disaster, environmental disaster, nuclear disaster, some world-ending catastrophe. He said, yeah, he said, you wonder where it's all coming to. I said to him, cheer up, George. The world will come to an end when the Lord Jesus comes again in glory. Oh, hello. We're not completely comatose. That's good. Well done. Thank you. But I mean, that's true, isn't it? You know, when you're looking for value, meaning, purpose, hope, the Lord Jesus is coming. Well, for the meantime, there is a time of tribulation. Whether it's the tribulation that the New Testament speaks of is uh, too difficult to take on now. But what we do know is this. It's not whether these people have shed their blood in the cause of Christ. It is that Christ has shed his blood in the cause of these people. People like you and me, but better still, people who are you and me, that Christ has died for us and for our salvation. Blood of the Lamb is a profound reference to the sacrificial death of Jesus, and whitened in the blood is a striking paradox. You know, whatever you're trying with your white garments um, to use to get them whiter and white, I suggest blood is not a good recommendation. It's a striking paradox. The great Australian Anglican commentator, uh, a man called Leon Morris, said, we should not let familiarity dull the splendor of this good news. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. This is blood that does not stain, but cleanses. That is truly amazing grace. In his temple is a surprising reference. As later in Revelation, it says there's no temple in Jerusalem, in the New Jerusalem. But here, it's likely that a physical temple is implied. It is the place where God is worshipped. Where is God worshipped? Well, in heaven, answer, all of it. Heaven needs no temple. It needs no holy place because it is all holy. And what are the people engaged in worship doing? They are celebrating because they are redeemed. They are rejoicing. They are restored to the presence of God. And just as God promised that he would spread his tabernacle or tent over the people of Israel, covering them with his protective shelter, this is the experience of the believer. We are covered in the protective shelter of God. The heavenly condition contrasts with the earthly experience of so many because people do suffer for their faith. The experience of starvation, thirst, and burning in the desert are forever past because the Lamb is also the shepherd. The sorrowful memory of pain and suffering mercifully removed by the Father. In 1972, a young woman was invited to sing a song with no words and no tune. I suggest that's rather better than some of the songs that people are listening to today, but that's a different matter. The vision of Revelation is the exact opposite of the philosophy of nihilism which the record was buying into. Life has no purpose, value, or meaning. The believer says no. In every circumstance, life has purpose, 
value and meaning. God holds out the hope for us that we can be redeemed, rejoicing and restored. And there are lessons to learn. If we are to be faithful in our witness, we must lovingly embrace believers and people from other cultures. If we are to be faithful in our witness, we must try to understand and appreciate one another. If we are to be faithful in our witness, we must forgive one another. When in church we turn up and choose to greet our friends at the expense of visitors, our witness is diminished. When in church we fail to try to know or understand and appreciate each other, our witness is diminished. When in church we are unforgiving or bitter, our witness is diminished. The great African-American William J. Seymour, who was one of the granddaddies of the Pentecostal movement of the century before last, as we must now say, said, the greatest sign of the Spirit's work is love. Well, God bless you all.